Uh, so I guess that's been your front line um, this week. Um, so we're carrying on in our uh, series that we started last week, uh, Life on the Front Line. It's been developed by the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, and it's very much about our oh, should we do that again? Uh, very much about our sort of Monday to um, to Saturday life. Um, so this week we're building on last week. If you remember last week, we were putting dots on the map as to where we're going to be tomorrow and that type of thing. And we're looking at wherever we are, which is, I guess, very much a continuation of that. Um, we've got a Bible passage, which we're going to look at now. Um, it's in Genesis chapter 28. Um, and it's the story of Jacob. Jacob's been on the run. Um, his life is a bit of a mess, really. He's stolen his brother's inheritance, or acquired it, let's say. And uh, his brother is about to kill him, so Jacob is running for his life. Um, so we're going to read uh, Genesis chapter 28, uh, starting from verse 10. Uh, page 30, if you've got a church Bible. So Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran, where I think his uncle lived. Um, when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones uh, from there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth and its, to and its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were descending and ascending, even ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out uh, to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought... Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! There is none, uh, this, th this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though it used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I am taking and, um, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all, of that, you give, and all that you give me I will give you a tenth. So there he was, uh, in the middle of nowhere, um, I suppose in modern day thinking, uh, in our country, it could have been, uh, I don't know, the middle of the M1. Uh, if you've been up and down the M1 recently, you would have seen there's roadworks, always roadworks on the M1. There's probably rocks and blocks of concrete he could have got um, for a pillar for his head. Um, let's have a little look. Could have been, some, ah, there we go, something like that. That's, uh, that's the M1 as it normally is, <laughs> roadworks, and if you're on the M1 and you stop for a break, which I don't suggest you do, but you'll be going no more than 50 miles an hour to protect the workforce, you may come across a gentleman who you probably won't recognise so far away in his orange viz, high viz jacket, because he normally sits here behind the drums, because uh, that is Callum. And as part of these uh, services, we like to get to know people a little bit. So I've asked Callum to come and share what he's going to be doing this time tomorrow. We're going to have a couple of these this morning, um, and then we're going to pray uh, for them at the end. So Callum, you take the microphone there. Sure. Um, so tell us what you're going to be doing uh, this time um, tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. Well, uh, it's a bit different for me this time tomorrow because I'm actually at college. So I do, um, I do four months a year where I'm at college, where I train to be a civil engineer. But on a usual day, I'd be on the M1 Smart Motorway Scheme, so Junction 13 to 16. So all the road works and things, uh, I'm sorry about that. 
Um, so, yeah, as I said, I'm trained to be a civil engineer, so, um, and I'm heavily involved in the install and drainage in the central res and now in the verges. So, as you can see, there's big trench boxes and trenches and things and all the rest of it. Um, saw cutting going on, and I'm surveying a new uh, surface water channel in the central res. Very so, good. And how long is, are those roadworks going on for, most importantly? <laughs> well, you'll be uh, pleased to know it will be finished in March 2022. 2022. <laughs> so, so as you drive down, make sure you wave and you may see Callum. It's, um, and we also want to know, I mean, we had, I know you weren't there this week necessarily, yeah. but we had massive storms this week. So is yeah. it, go and stand by the microphone there, Callum. Are, are yeah. you, um, is it all weathers? Yeah, out all weathers basically, but uh, when it's particularly bad, sites are closed. So this week we've had a few days where the sites have been closed because right, obviously they're spraying things and all the rest of it. So, so a slightly yeah. strange question. What do you like about being there? <laughs> what it says on the sheet. <laughs> uh, well, I like interacting with loads of different people on the site. Our site's huge, so there's so many different people on the projects, like different experiences and getting to know people and learning off them as well on the job is a great... Uh, experience to have um, and then also being at college and applying your knowledge through college and on site and things so that's one of the particular things I enjoy the most um, yeah and just it's a good team to be in great good bonds and things like that so good relationships and are there any pressure points uh, yeah so basically delivering on time with the projects and things obviously <laughs> uh, trying to get it finished by March 2022 um, but then also you have delays a lot of the weather this week that's obviously um, put the program back a bit but uh, yeah we try basically and get uh, everything done on time and then also being out on site obviously I'm part of the younger generation there's loads of older generation people that are working on site so there's pressure points in trying to meet the needs of them and meet the needs of the younger generation and then it's also kind of difficult you telling them what to do and then they're like well I've been doing this a lot longer than you so what are you doing telling me so yeah there's things like that so and I guess the, the the question is, is it, what, what do you think God's purpose may be for you in the work that you're doing there? Um, well, I believe that God puts you in the, uh, situations in the, right, in the right place at the right time and things. So for me, he's put me here for this for a reason, um, mainly because there's obviously in the construction industry, there's a lot of mental health issues and like suicides and things like that. So trying to reach the needs of people with their issues and things and talking to them. So I've been trained as a mental health first aider, so we're trying to meet the needs of people and speak to them if they've got any problems and things, and yeah, sit down and talk to them about how you've come out of the situations and how perhaps God's helped you and other people around you, Christian friends and things, and then also opportunity to try and pray for them as well. Excellent. And things to pray for for you, which we'll do at the end? Yeah, uh, mainly just uh, college work, so there's been a few issues with assignments and things and uh, lecturers and stuff, so hopefully that can be sorted and we can get everything done by the deadlines and stuff. Um, and then just more of our opportunities again to pray for people at work and speak to people about their uh, issues and needs. And then again, just uh, safety, working out on the roads, obviously quite dangerous in plant and person interface and things, and then also the life <coughs> as well. So. Excellent. Callum, thank you very much. Have you ever picked up a rock, put it down as a pillow and fallen asleep on site? <laughs> Not yet, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thanks. We're going to uh, pray for Callum and more is going to come later. Very good, thank you. So, in the Bible, God turns up in very ordinary places. Uh, that, I think, is a very ordinary place. People... Hundreds and thousands of people passing uh, every day. And, and actually, if you look at it in the Bible, it's not necessarily about in the temples and, and in the big gatherings and in the church services on a Sunday morning as we try and get to a position and say, Lord, we welcome you, which is a slightly strange sort of thought in any case about us welcoming God. Um, as we often say, you know, God is always there. And we know that Jesus has said, and we'll think about this more later, that he's promised to be with us all uh, to the very end of the age. But, you know, God, when he turns up in the Bible, he may turn up uh, by a burning bush or the Elijah story that we're hearing about later. You know, Elijah, after that amazing time and, and uh, all those amazing miracles that are going, and he ran, uh, sort of ran and then got tired and God whispered to him 
uh, at the entrance of a cave. It may be uh, up a tree with Jesus, uh, with Zacchaeus, or if you're Mary Magdalene, it may be he's behind you as, his, as she's looking in the tomb. So God turns up in different places. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if that's a very sound theology, but you know, let's take that for now. He can turn up on the M1. He can turn up as you're supporting someone. Mental health first aid is a fantastic thing to do. Uh, as you're just chatting alongside with people and everything else. That is where God is um, in our day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, um, probably not quite the same as our demographic. I'm not quite sure. I won't ask for a raise of hands. But 75% of 16 to 65-year-olds in this country are in employment. In employment, not unemployment. In employment. Um, and I guess... For a lot, for most of us, that means that our front line, we would probably describe as being um, at our place of work. But for others, it's very different. You may do volunteering, you may uh, be helping out with a family, you may be meeting up with friends, you may be running little groups and such like. Um, so it's always very, very different. But I just wanted to um, think a little bit. I mean, we always want to share our lives with people. As Christians, we want to share our lives, we want to share our faith. Um, and as I was sort of thinking about this, I, I was thinking about the Evangelical Alliance a few years ago. Do you remember there's a whole thing about um, the lady who wore a cross on the aeroplane and a nurse who was uh, told off for praying and, and all that type of thing? So the Evangelical Alliance a few years ago uh, worked and gave some guidelines about sharing your faith uh, in the workplace. Um, if you want to, I've, I'm going to put them on the screen. Um, there's a whole booklet. You can Google Speak Up by the Evangelical Alliance, and you can go through these in a whole little more detail. But I just wanted to, um, and this isn't just for the workplace, but I guess it is most practical for the workplace. So if you're in your workplace um, and you want to share your faith, um, these would just, and I'm not going to go through them all, but just things like remember what you're there for. You know, if you're employed, you are there to work primarily. That's what you're paid for. Um, and if you are not working hard, we are called, we're told to work with all of our efforts in what we do. So first and foremost, you should be working hard in your workplace. If you're not, that isn't a good witness as far as I'm concerned, because people will think you're they're having to take your strain and that type of thing. So if you work, remember that's what you're there for. I pray for people. If you want to share your, your faith with people, choose your time and your place. Probably not in the middle of a meeting where there's a lot of stresses going on. Maybe, and, and I guess the important thing is it's about relationship. It's not about, oh, I really want to tell someone about my faith. I'm going to do it now. If you've got a journey with people, you've got to be authentic in your faith. You've got to really care about them and want to support them and such like. And then it'll be natural. You may, you may have the opportunity to go out for a coffee or a drink or whatever, um, or whatever you do after work and, and talk about your faith a bit more. Don't abuse authority. That's a really important one. If you're uh, in some level of authority of work, uh, at work, um, or in family life, or in whatever you're doing, don't abuse that authority. Um, be gentle. Um, don't be judgmental towards people. Um, I like this one. Develop good habits, and that can be in so many different ways. But, but you know, are you the type of person who people will come to when they have got issues? They want to talk to you because you know that they'll have an open ear, that you will care for them, that you'll follow up with them. Um, offer to pray sensitively. Again, just something like, I've been praying for you about that. You know, you told me about, I, 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 I want to pray for, about that, but, but not necessarily there, right there, can I pray for you and all that type of thing, because that probably may not be sensitive. It may be appropriate, but, but you know, I think to say things like, oh, I was praying about what you said last night or, or whatever, people appreciate that. I know from times when I was working in, in industry, and I remember one particular occasion, there was a chap whose father had a very bad heart condition very suddenly. And uh, you know, I was able to chat with him and say, I've been praying for you about that. And we had a, a fantastic little conversation. So, so tell people that you're praying, uh, but don't necessarily do it in your face, as it were. Um, respect people. Um, and I think the, the last one is do what you can. Yeah, do tell people about your faith. Um, but probably more importantly is journey with people, be there for people. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about that a bit more in a second. Um, 
So last week, we spoke about, um, do you remember we did the dots? We put the dots on the map. I wanted this week to introduce, because we're talking more about where we are, the concept of a heat map. Um, so a heat map is, as it says on the, in the word, um, this particular one is the heat map of heat. Uh, so on July the 25th last year, apparently we broke the records. Um, maybe this week we broke some records for floods, but for, for um, last year it was, and it, this, a heat map is clearly the more intense the red, uh, the more intense the heat. Um, so you can see in the, you know, we were pretty hot uh, down in France, in the northwest of France there, it was, it was very hot, not quite so hot uh, in the northeast of Scotland and in, and in Ireland and such like. <coughs> so that's a heat map, and as I, was, I, I just thought for a bit of fun, we'd look at a couple of different types of heat maps and see if you can guess what these are. So here is a heat map, this is the UK. Uh, London is a little bit, uh, London hasn't moved up into the North Sea, but London has been blown up into, in the top right hand corner. Um, and so this is a heat map, it's not about temperature this one, this is about something else. Can anyone have a guess as to what this may be? Sorry? Population? Population? No, it could be, but it's not. Price of houses, you're getting closer, very close. This is actually salaries. Um, you probably can't see these, so I don't know why I blocked it out. But you know, so if you are, I, I tell you what it says. If you uh, live in um, Sheffield, on average, uh, your average salary is going to be about sixteen thousand pounds a year. Whereas if you work in uh, Westminster North, your average salary is thirty-nine thousand seven hundred and seventy-five pounds. Okay, so that's a, that's a heat map. Here's another one, uh, just for a bit of, again, a bit of fun. This is a gardening one, okay, just to give you a clue. No one will get this one, okay. And, well, you may do. Anyone have a guess? No. Nope. Anyone know what that is? It's what, sorry? It may be, it's not. No, it's not. No, no. It's, it's what? Oh, I heard it. Japanese knotweed. That is it. This is Japanese knotweed, apparently. And there is a heat map in the country for Japanese knotweed. Not, I've got no idea what it is. It not, it's not very good, is it, apparently, I would imagine. So uh, if you're in London or in South Wales or up in the sort of northwest direction, apparently it's a terrible, terrible lot of Japanese knotweed around. Uh, this is my favourite. Uh, Mike Wells isn't here this morning, but he would like this one. You will never get this one. This is the spiciness of curries around the country. <laughs> So if you want a really spicy curry, then you go down to the sort of southeast of England by the looks of it. So, um, and then uh, the last one is, and this was, you know, we, we put those red dots on. This is going to scare you, okay, some of you. It doesn't really scare me. This is from Google, and this is my heat map from Google from tw since, since 2014. So you can see, uh, it's not very clear, I know, but I went on a holiday. I know it's 2014 because we haven't been there since to uh, our friends in France in 2014. Uh, in the Midlands, there's lots of heat, and West Wales, because we go on holiday there. My mum's up in, uh, in Norfolk. Uh, you know, and, and that, so it's not quite like that heat map, but actually, I just wanted to make the point, if you like, that wherever we are, it isn't always about just our place of work. It is wherever we go and whatever we do, and for many of us, it is very different. Um, and it may be it's where you drop the kids off at school. It may be, you know, meeting people at Wednesdays at two. It, it may be, um, you know, where you volunteer on a, on a Tuesday or whatever it may be, or on a Friday at, at, at Community Cafe. It may be people who come to visit you every day uh, in your house and, and those types of things. Those are the people and that is the place where God has put you to be salt and light. Um, we talk often, don't we, about being salt and light in the world. And I'm going to ask, I should have forewarned you about this, but I'd love you if you could sort of shout out words that would describe what it means to be salt and light in the place that we, where we work. What, what types of things would describe uh, salt and light for us in what we do? Believer. What, sorry? Believer. Okay, if you're a believer and you can tell people you're a believer, yeah. Not to be confrontational. Not to be confrontational. Yeah, exactly, and to be sort of gentle within that and that type of thing. I heard something over there. Compassionate. Compassionate. 
Absolutely. So with your work colleagues being compassionate and particularly if they're going through things, kindness, I heard. Did I? Yeah, I think. Um, so, yep. Any more? Just and true. Just and true. Understanding. Understanding. Exactly. So these, are, these aren't super spiritual words, are they? These are very normal words about how we should be behaving in our places that we are finding ourselves, whether it be in work or whether it be wherever. And it shows us being authentic. And I think if we are going to have any impact, to be able to talk to people about our journey and our, and our faith and encourage them to think about their journey and their faith, they have to see that we're authentic. And those are important types of words that we should be going through. And there's another final heat map that I wanted to show. Um, can anyone guess what this is a heat map of? An ocean? An ocean? No, no, no. It's, it's generally around... Uh, the white is the hot spots, if you like, and you can probably see the world there. Population. population. Believers. Believers? No, so you said population, didn't you? Uh, no, no, not light. John, is it your territory? You may know this. No, oh, I think you get it. Internet, nearly. This is 20, this is the uh, heat map of Facebook users around the world, okay? So there was another one from 2010 when there were half a billion users. This is from 2017 where there were two billion users. You can see that where China is, which is just above the white bit, which is India, it is black or blue because you're not allowed to have Facebook in China and I guess North Korea would be, be the same. Um, and I just really wanted to make the point that nowadays, um, and again, I know it's not for everybody, um, but our presence isn't always just about physical presence. Uh, nowadays, more and more, it is about what we are doing online and how we interact. So I was going to ask a question here. Um, and this isn't whether you use it, okay? This is whether you have an account or whether you've ever used it, okay? So I want to know how many people have got a Snapchat account. Come on, Carl, you've got one. Yay, right, a few of us. Some of us maybe set them up to try and check on what our kids are doing and try and understand it and all that type of stuff. Um, what else have I got written down here? Instagram, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Instagram, keep your hands up. Uh, Twitter, no, Facebook. Got an account, What? right, has anyone ever used WhatsApp? Uh, got you. Uh, has anyone ever, right, I've got one more here, email. Anyone ever sent an email? Keep your hands up. Anyone ever used a telephone? <laughs> ah, yes, we all have, haven't we? All right, you can put your hands down now. I just really want to make the point that more and more and more, and yes, you know, generationally, so I don't understand Snapchat, if I'm honest about it. It completely blows my mind and everything else. But, but more and more, we are making comments in a sphere that isn't physical in front of people. And I think it's really important as Christians that we think about how we do that and maybe ask ourselves a question. If that person that I'm making a comment about was standing here right in front of me now, would I actually say that? Or am I just putting it out there because I can? Um, is what I am saying, is it uplifting? Could it be misunderstood? Because I know when I put things out there, it can often be misunderstood. Um, now, I'm not saying you shouldn't put things out there, you know, because I think it's, these platforms are quite good um, to be able to, you know, particularly for family WhatsApp groups and all those types of things, it's great. Um, but, but, but I don't think we should be scared of using these technologies. Um, but we just need to be careful. Um, and I think we need to be accountable as well to each other. And gently, uh, if ever we see, if ever you see me saying anything, that I shouldn't do, uh, gently mention it to me and I'll have a, we'll have a chat and we'll discuss whether I was inappropriate and if I was, hopefully I would say sorry. But, but the world nowadays is very different. It's not just about um, physical uh, presence, it's about online presence as well. So another thing I just wanted to pull out was from Jacob's life was that um, <laughs> Jacob had a, an encounter with God, if you like, in the presence of God. God turned up. Um, but his life was a complete mess, quite honestly. He was um, 
on the run. It was just about to get a whole load more messy. He thought he'd married one girl and then woke up and found he'd married someone completely different. Um, and his life was, you know, really not in a good place. And, you know, we had George Verwer here, didn't we, a few weeks ago? And very much talking about his book, Messiology, um, and how he had been on that journey, if you like. And as Christians, to be able to stand up and say, yeah, God works in the mess of our lives. This isn't all about us trying to make everything perfect, so that everybody looks at us in our workplace or wherever we are as the perfect people. It's actually recognizing that, yes, there is a mess. So, you know, I have, uh, I have to say, many times, well, not many times, but occasionally, uh, thumped the desk in work meetings or, or have stormed out of, stormed out of uh, meetings and, or said things that I really wished I hadn't said. And, you know, there's a danger at that point in time to think, well, everyone's going to see me as a sham, to see that, I, you know, I say I'm a Christian, but I, you know, get that dreaded, oh, you call yourself a Christian type of thing. But actually, I think, let's face the reality, that is what life is like. We are not perfect the whole time in anything that we do. But the thing that people really want to see is authenticity. And I just want us to encourage us to think about one word that we as Christians should really, really understand, but is a word that doesn't get used that much, I don't think, in general society. And that is a word which is sorry. So when we mess up, and when we do things that we wish we hadn't done, and we say something to a work colleague that we wish we hadn't said or whatever, don't go all defensive. Don't go and sort of try and justify it and everything else, but just go and say sorry to them. And I think that is an amazing witness. You know, I'm not saying go and mess up so you can say sorry, but you know, when we do mess up, be willing to do it. Because I think people will really, really see the difference that Christians have if they can see that we're willing to actually admit our mistakes and say sorry. And you know, quite honestly, guys, if we can't do that, then where is our faith? Because we've had to say sorry before God. So why can't we say sorry before those people that we come into contact with? Finally, um, and then I'm going to ask Moira to come up in a minute um, to, uh, to share what she's going to be doing this time tomorrow. Um, Jacob did recognize God's presence. So, you know, he'd, he'd fallen asleep, he'd had a dream, probably got a bit of a sore head when he woke up in the morning, but he knew that God had been there, that the awesome presence of God had been there. And it transformed his view. He realized that all of a sudden he wasn't just running, but he actually had God in his eye. Now, I don't know, he said, if God does this and if God does that, then I will give one-tenth of everything. It seems a bit stingy to me. You know, if God is going to do that for him and basically save his life, I would say, well, why can't you give everything to him? But in any case, Jacob recognized God's presence and it transformed his view. And you know, it's the same for us in our relationships with our work colleagues, with our friends. And we can know that and we can claim it, that Jesus has said the very last words in, in Matthew's gospel, that I promise I will be with you always to the very end of the age. We can know that when we are with people, we have God's presence with us through the power of his Holy Spirit. And, and it may be messy. Jacob's life didn't get perfect straight after that. As I said, it got a whole lot more messy. But it was a completely different perspective on the journey that he was going on. And I guess for us, wherever we are, whatever we do, then maybe if we know that God is with us and in those relationships and in those conversations, God is with us. When we say sorry, that is actually God working. Then maybe it will transform our sort of view of tomorrow and it will transform our view of the rest of the week. Uh, we're going to pray. Um, there's a prayer that's going to come on the screen. Hopefully it's readable. So, um, in fact, why don't we all stand, get a bit of circulation going. Let's pray this, and then Maura is going to come up and, uh, and share what she's doing this time tomorrow. Let's pray. Uh, Lord of all creation, thank you that our everyday, ordinary places matter to you and make a difference there. 
We offer you the places where we live, work, study and pray. May we serve you and bear witness to you wherever we are this week. And may we know your presence with us in these places. Amen. Thank you. I'm more to come and uh, join us. This is an easy one to be more than Let me get one last question. Uh, so, Maura, tell us what are you doing this time tomorrow? This time tomorrow, I shall be probably driving or just about arriving at work, having spent the first bit of Monday morning rushing around, sorting out my family, dropping craft off for toddlers and this, that, and the other, and I'll be arriving at work. And I work part time as a GP in a practice in South Leamington, um, and the other half of the time, I'm looking after. Supporting two teenage daughters and an 18 month old grandson, which is quite hectic. And points Yeah, I mean, certainly at the work, um, I'm probably at home as well, it's kind of a point of pressure, it's not really what goes on, it's like pressure from the minute you get into the minute you leave. So it's kind of just a bit full on all the time, really. Um, certainly at work, um, pressure, I mean, just the sheer volume of patients, the complexity of kind of the, the health problems, the social problems, uh, really frustrations of the constraints of um, kind of the healthcare systems and, you know, trying to battle with non-existent mental health services and stuff. Uh, with paperwork and all the processes and running a business. I am actually seeing a partner now, which is kind of really quite scary. Um, <laughs> um, and then just sort of full on kind of um, supporting um, my daughter moving into a new flat and um, uh, sort of looking after Jason quite a lot of the time. So work my balance is kind of, yeah, quite, quite challenging. Um, what do you like about um, yeah, and I think, although it's fairly full on, being a GP is a real privilege. Um, you get to, to build relationships with people. I mean, you know, there's some people that I've known now, been working there for 18 years, and there are some people that I've known for 18 years. And you build up a relationship, and, you know, people tell their GP things that they may not tell anybody else, and that's a real privilege. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think that is, and it also, um, the, the range of kind of things that people share about their very personal lives, it really helps you to put your own life and problems in perspective, and I think it's a real privilege to be in that position. Um, I'm also find at work, um, I feel really blessed by my work colleagues. Um, we have a very, very supportive work culture, which helps to balance the, the pressures. Um, you know, I think um, that's been a real blessing because I'm some senior partner now and that was going to be quite a scary thing. But we've had new, new GPs that have come into the practice that have taken quite a lot of the share of, of, of kind of um, leadership and guidance because I'm not a natural leader. And, and actually that's been such a relief for me and a, and a real blessing. And we have WhatsApp groups, we go out and sort of socially and, um, and I think if people are feeling pressured at work or kind of things going on at home, we have a, we have a kind of um, environment where we help each other out and support one another, which I think is really great. So I, I really value that and feel blessed by that and enjoy being a part of a team. And pressure points um, for you right now? Um, no, what might no, yeah, done that. I've done what that bit. Purpose, what, what might God's purpose be for you right now? Sorry, just... um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think, as Esty mentioned last time when she shared, it's actually really difficult to be a direct witness to patients because um, you're not really allowed to. Um, but I do feel that God uses me a lot in those um, situations. Um, I think people recognise when you treat people and you try and see people as God sees them. Um, 
and that's evident. You know, you get, you get kind of people who come and thank you, sometimes when you haven't actually been able to do very much. And so just thank you for listening and understanding and getting it. And actually, that kind of makes you feel like um, actually you are helping them, even if you're not directly, you know, sort of sharing your faith, that, that, that to, to see people as God sees them, people appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's, that's definitely a role there. Um, and also, I was quite encouraged by George Verwer's sort of concept of messiology um, that James just talked about. Um, I think I'm the only Christian in, in my workplace, um, um, and everybody knows that, but I definitely feel that I'm really not the best example of someone who's got everything sorted and life in control. And, um, and actually, because we have quite a, a kind of supportive and close relationship with one another, people know exactly, you know, kind of what's what's going on in my life and, and, and they know that I'm not sorted and 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 actually I think um, I'm really encouraged that that um, God is working in that situation um, um, even though it seems a bit kind of not very sorted. Um, so I'm I, I I think there are opportunities to um, share with colleagues um, how God is working in your life, even if your life is going a bit. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, prayer points. Um, I've been challenged really to just pray more, pray more about work, pray more about the kids, pray more about everything really, because um, actually sometimes life is a bit <coughs> out of our control in terms of. Uh, and, but if God is in control, then actually He's just been saying to me. <coughs> just pray about it and leave it with me so and, and I've been trying to do that recently and I just would like prayer that I can persist in in, in being, prayerful. being prayerful yeah um, and also open praying for that and my eyes be open to see how God is working in the midst of all the busyness um, because I think if we can see how God is working in the busyness then that changes our perspective a bit. So I just want to see things how God sees it. Um, and I think I, I was challenged as well about if we're praying more, um, I would like to be able to share, you know, sort of share my prayers in a sense. So if you are praying for work colleagues or you're praying for something for your own situation or you're praying for your kids or whatever, it's just to say... Quite simply, you know, I've, I've been, to have the boldness to say, I've been praying for you about that, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm praying for extra energy this week, or doing that, like, because I think if we share our prayers, it doesn't necessarily demand a response from other people, um, but actually, if our share, prayers are being sh shared with the people we're praying about, or kind of situation we're praying about, when God answers our prayers, that's an encouragement to us, but then other people can see the answers to the prayers as well because they know what you've been praying about. So I just think prayer for my prayer life. Very good. <laughs> that was the wrong way of saying prayer for prayer. Yeah. Say there. Yeah. <laughs> um,